It's Warp 10, the show where we count down just about everything. Today in Warp 10, we count down the top 10 greatest sci-fi inventions that came to real life. Let's go over the criteria for today's list. Number one, the invention must have been in a novel at some point and that invention became true. Number two, it must be used or usable in everyday life, meaning that the invention wasn't just a one-off thing that somebody created after they read a science fiction novel. It had to be something that could be used on a regular basis. Okay, usually here on Warp 10, I don't read from a script. I kind of do this on the fly. But today I'm going to be reading quotes from books. So if you'll forgive me, I'm going to be holding up a piece of paper and reading from it today. Number 10, the cubicle. Everybody who has worked in an office building has worked in a cubicle from time to time. And the invention was written about first in 1909 by E.M. Forrester. Imagine if you can a small room, hexagonal in shape, that has a cell of a bee. It is lighted neither by window nor by lamp, yet it is filled with a soft radiance. There are no apertures for ventilation, yet this air is fresh. There are no musical instruments, and yet the moment that my meditation opens, this room is throbbing with melodious sounds. An armchair is in the center, by its side a reading desk that holds all furniture. In the armchair there is a swaddled lump of flesh, a woman about five foot in height, with a face as white as fungus. It is to her that this room belongs. Number nine, the submarine. Just about everybody's read or heard about or went to Disney World and saw 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. That comes from a Jules Verne novel written in 1869. Now, unfortunately, this is the only one that sort of made it to this list and it made it this way, but it's close enough to where I gave it a pass. Technically, the submarine came out in 1865. It was used in the U.S. Civil War. Now, Jules Verne wrote about it in his book 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea in 1869, which is close enough by my standard. And, of course, he wrote about how the submarine was going to be used in a bigger sense other than just warfare. For some time, past vessels had been met by an enormous thing, a long object, spindle-shaped, occasionally phosphorescent, and infinitely larger and more rapid in its movements than a whale. Number eight, Automatic Doors, written about by H.G. Wells in 1899. The two men addressed turned obediently. After one reluctant glance at Graham, and instead of going through the archway as he expected, walked straight to the dead wall of the apartment opposite the archway. And then came a strange thing. A long strip of this apparently solid wall rolled up with a snap, hung over with the two retreating men, and fell again. And immediately Graham was alone in the new corner, and the purple road man with the flaxen beard. Number seven, video conferencing. Hugo Gernsback wrote in 1911 in a book called Ralph 124 Charlie 41 Plus. Gernsback looked in the future and devised a device that was decades before the television was even invented. Stepping to the telephote on the sidewall, he pressed a group of buttons and in a few minutes the faceplate of the telephote became luminous, revealing the face of a clean-shaven man about 30, pleasant but serious face. As soon as he recognized the face of Ralph in his own telephote, he smiled and said, Hello, Ralph. Hello, Edward. I wanted to ask you if you could come over to the laboratory tomorrow morning. I have something unusually interesting to show you. Look. He stepped to one side of his instrument so his friend could see the apparatus on the table about 10 feet from the telephote faceplate. Number six, earbud headphones, 1950. Ray Bradbury mentioned these in his book, Fahrenheit 451. And in her ears, the little seashells, the thimble radios tamped tight, an electronic ocean of sound, of music and talk, and music and talk coming in, in on the shore of her unsleeping mind. Number five, virtual reality games. Arthur C. Clarke wrote about this in his novel, The City and the Stars. He wrote about this in 1956. This was many, many years before video games were even invented. Of all the thousands of forms of recreation in the city, these were the most popular. When you entered a saga, you were not merely a passive observer. You were an active participant and possessed or seemed to possess free will. The events and scenes which were raw material of your adventures might have been prepared beforehand by forgotten artists, but there was enough flexibility to allow for wide variation. You could go to these phantom worlds with your friends, seeking the excitement that did not exist in despair. And as long as a dream lasted, there was no way in which it could be distinguished from reality. Number four, radar. The idea first came from a sci-fi novel written in 1911 by Hugo Gernsback titled Ralph 124C41+. I was a radar technician in the Navy for many years, and the description that Gernsback writes about in 1911 is so spot on, it's kind of scary. He writes, 
A pulsing polarized ether wave, if directed on a metal object, can be reflected in the same manner as a light ray is reflected from the bright surface. By manipulating the entire apparatus like a searchlight, waves would be sent over a large area. Sooner or later, these waves would strike a space flyer. A small part of these waves would strike the metal body of a flyer, and these rays would be reflected back to the sending apparatus. Here they would fall on the actinoscope which records only the reflective waves, not the directed ones. From the intensity and the elapsed time of the reflected impulses, the distance between the Earth and the flyer can be accurately estimated. That's scary. Number three, the iPad, 1968. Arthur C. Clarke mentions this ubiquitous invention in his novel 2001, A Space Odyssey. When he tired of the official reports and memoranda and minutes, he would plug in his fool's cap sized newspad into the ship's information circuit and scan the latest reports from Earth. One by one, he would conjure up the world's major electronic papers. Switching to the display unit's short-term memory, he would hold the front page while he quickly searched the headlines and noted the items that interested him. Each had its own two-digit reference. When he punched in that, the postage stamp size reticle would expand until it nearly filled the screen and he could read it with comfort. When he had finished, he would flash back to the completed page and select a new subject for detailed examination. I don't know about you, but that's pretty spot on to what an iPad is. Number two, The Tank, 1903. H.G. Wells mentioned this invention of war in the story The Land Ironclads. Wells might have been calling upon the drawings of Leonardo da Vinci when he came up with these war machines. He writes, Wit, 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 sang something in the air. Bang came the shrapnel, bursting close at hand as it seemed our two men were lying flat in a dip on the ground. And the light and everything had gone again, leaving a vast note of interrogation upon the night. The war correspondent came within bawling range. What the deuce was it? Shooting our men down. Black, said the artist, and like a fort, not two hundred yards from the first trench. He sought for comparisons in his mind. Something between a big blockhouse and a giant's dish cover, he said. And they were running, said the war correspondent. You'd run up a thing like that with a searchlight on top to help it, turned up like a growling nightmare in the middle of the night. No other invention causes such fear and trembling on a mass scale. H.G. Wells, in A World Set Free, discusses the bomb in amazing detail. So much so that Leo Slazard, Manhattan Project developer, noted that in his book The American Atom. It's remarkable that Wells should have written those pages in 1914. Of course, all this is moonshine, but I have reason to believe in that so far as the industrial applications of the present discoveries in physics are concerned, the forecast of the writers may prove to be more accurate than the forecast of the scientists. Thanks a lot for watching this week. Sorry about the technical difficulties. I should have that fixed next week. Not a problem. I do want to mention that before I was on this new channel, Geek Domo, I was on Geekasaurus, which has been my persona online for a long time, but that's more of a gaming persona. This new persona is more for tech, reviews, uh, movies, all that kind of stuff that doesn't really fit in a gaming channel. So that's why I started a new channel called Geek Domo. So anybody who's watching me on Geekasaurus, please come on over and subscribe to me over here. I'm continuing on with this channel. The other channel, Geekasaurus, is going to be there, but I'm just going to kind of leave the videos alone and let them sort of fester. Thanks a lot for watching Warp 10 this week. Come back next week where you guys will tell me what you want to see in the comments below.